Hi everyone, welcome to the session today titled Adolescence's Access to Abortion. We will start now and I hope more people keep joining in. Before we start, I just want to quickly do a recap of the housekeeping. We want to ensure that this is a safe and conducive online space for all participants to uh, be part of the session. So we have uh, interpretations today from English to Spanish and Spanish to English. If you do require interpretations, please click on the globe icon on your screen. Please rename yourself, mentioning your name, country and organizational affiliation so that you know we know where you're joining from. Uh, please do not share any inappropriate audio, video, or written content in the chat box or Q&A box. Please do not take any photos or videos of the workshop proceedings. Uh, I would request all of you to keep yourself muted and unmute yourself only when you're making a comment or asking a question. Uh, this is to eliminate ambient noise and to make sure that we are able to run the session smoothly. If you want to talk, please use raise your hand feature or write your question in the Q&A box. We are recording this session and the recording will be shared on the uh, International Campaign for Women's Right to Safe Abortion newsletter as well as on Yana's YouTube page. If anybody wants to remain anonymous, please do intermit me. And these are the details that you already have probably in your mailbox because I had sent this earlier. If you do want to join the network, here's the link. Please fill in the form and uh, you can be part of the YANA list serve. And it is a great pleasure to introduce Margaret Harpin from Center for Reproductive Rights. Margaret Harpin is a legal advisor on the legal strategies, innovation, and research team at the Center for Reproductive Rights. She serves as the team's leading legal analyst and researcher on global comparative abortion law and emerging reproductive rights trends. As a component of this role, she tracks, monitors, and analyzes national abortion laws in every country in the world to understand global trends in abortion law and develop key resources on the status of abortion law globally. Margaret also leads research to support the development of institutional positions, including human rights norms around adolescents' consent to SRH services and hosts trainings on international human rights law. Previously, she served as the legal fellow in the Global Legal Program developing capacity building initiatives that supported advocates in utilizing the human rights framework to advance sexual and reproductive health and rights. Prior to joining the, net, the center, Margaret worked at a variety of organizations, including the World Health Organization, the United Nations Human Commissioner for Refugees, and the Center for Reproductive Rights and Justice. Margaret is a U.S. licensed attorney and holds a JD from Boston University School of Law, a MSc in Global Health and Development from University College of London, and a BA from Smith College. Um, and with that, I hand it over to you, Margaret. Really looking forward to the session. I just wanted to say one more thing before we begin. Sorry. Uh, it is to say that, you know, uh, all of these people who are joining in today are already working on sexual and reproductive health and rights, on abortion rights in their own countries. And we all know how difficult it is to get permissions for uh, adolescents to get abortion access. So I would really request all participants to engage in the session, ask questions. I'm watching the chat box. So if you have questions, uh, please keep, keep them coming and uh, we can take the questions later with Margaret. So with that, over to you, Margaret. Thanks so much for joining in. 
Thanks, Shruti. Um, and welcome, everyone. Uh, this presentation or session is to introduce um, adolescents' rights and access to abortion services at the international and regional levels. Um, as Shruti mentioned, my name is Margaret Harpin, um, and I am an international human rights lawyer working at the Center for Reproductive Rights. Um, and as Shruti mentioned, in my role, um, I focus mainly on comparative abortion law, um, and I also research emerging reproductive rights trends, including capacity and consent for adolescents' rights and access to services. Um, so this session will provide a brief overview of human rights instruments and mechanisms before delving into key human rights norms, principles, and rights around uh, adolescents' access to abortion services. We will also discuss the status of abortion laws around the world, barriers to access, and ways to engage with the human rights mechanisms to advance abortion access for adolescents at the international and regional levels. And there's a lot of content. I will pause periodically uh, during the session for any questions and as well as reserve time at the end um, for further questions. And as this is a, a very dense topic, as I'm sure you know, um, there's a lot of content in this presentation. Uh, I included most of the information on the slides. Uh, so the slides are very content heavy, um, but the, the goal is that they can be used as a resource as needed in your work. Um, so in the interest of time, I may skip over some content, um, but we will be sure to circulate this presentation and the slides um, uh, after the presentation. So you can have them as a resource. Um, and I am sharing my screen, so forgive me if I am still trying to work out. Okay, there we go. Um, so before jumping into the, the content itself, um, I just wanted to provide a brief overview of the center um, and the work that we do. So the, the center is a, a global human rights organization of uh, lawyers and advocates who ensure reproductive rights are protected um, in law as a fundamental human rights for the dignity, equality, uh, health, and well-being of every person. We were founded in uh, 1992, and the center's work focuses on litigation, advocacy, and legal policy and development, and spans across five continents. And we have offices in Colombia, Kenya, Switzerland, and the US, as well as attorneys based in several countries across Asia. The center uses constitutional, international, and comparative human rights law to transform how reproductive rights are understood by courts, governments, and human rights bodies. And overall, our work broadly covers reproductive rights issues, including access to life-saving obstetric care, sexual and reproductive health services for adolescents, contraception, maternal health and safe abortion services, as well as the prevention of forced sterilization and child marriage. So jumping into the content, oh, sorry. Um, I am uh, going to begin with an overview of international human rights law. Human rights principles set the foundation for adolescents' rights, and advocates can use these principles and rights to pressure governments to fulfill their human rights obligations to advance adolescents' access to abortion services through uh, human rights accountability mechanisms. I understand that you've received a, a brief background of uh, human rights law already, so I'm just going to focus on the most relevant instruments and mechanisms for the topic today and touch briefly on some of the fundamental principles that are most relevant. So human rights are rights that every person simply has because they are human beings. Human rights give the pe people the freedom to choose how they live, how they express themselves, and guarantee people the means necessary to satisfy their basic needs, such as food, housing, and education. These rights are not just a promise, but are recognized in law, thus binding obligations on the state. Uh, advocates can ensure that these rights are realized and upheld by states through various mechanisms, which we will discuss during the presentation. Um, and just a quick note that uh, human rights law uses the term states to refer to countries. International human rights instruments can be classified into declarations, which are political agreements that are not necessarily legally binding, uh, such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and treaties, which are legally binding instruments under international law. And these include the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, known as CEDAW, or the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the CRC. 
Um, it is also possible to further divide these instruments into global instruments to which any state in the world can be a party, um, such as CEDAW and CRC, or regional instruments that are restricted to states in a particular region of the world. Um, for example, the, the Maputo Protocol, also known as the Protocol to the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, uh, uh, the Rights of Women in Africa, um, which is specific to countries in Africa. And it is important to note uh, the distinction between a state signing and a state ratifying human rights treaties. So a state initially signs a, a treaty to uh, indicate an intention that the state will comply with the obligations in the treaty. Um, well, then later the state will then ratify the treaty at which point the treaty becomes officially binding on the state and the, the state is obligated to uh, comply with all of the provisions within the treaty or essentially attempt and uh, work towards complying. These treaties and corresponding human rights mechanisms can be used as advocacy tools to advance adolescents' access uh, to services, um, as we'll see later in the presentation. Moving forward, all nine, there, there are nine core human rights treaties, and they all have their own monitoring committees of independent experts known as treaty monitoring bodies, or as we refer to them as TMBs. TMBs are committees of experts charged with overseeing states' compliance with human rights treaties. There are 10 TMBs um, because the treaty that governs the rights to prevent torture has two TMBs. Um, and each TMB is responsible for a specific human rights treaty, and they hold the states that have ratified that particular treaty accountable to the provisions within that treaty. Um, and each TMB reviews um, every state's party's compliance with the obligations to which they have agreed. Um, so the TMBs have a mandate to only address the rights that are elucidated within their particular treaty. The TMBs have several mechanisms for ensuring accountability and guiding states on how they can interpret the language of the treaty. And I believe, yes. Um, so these are several opportunities and mechanisms that the uh, TMPs use for um, uh, holding states accountable to the obligations and the agreements that they've made to um, meet all of the provisions within each treaty that they have ratified and, and decided to uh, uphold. Um, so first, there are things called the periodic reviews, where states are periodically reviewed by uh, the committees of the treaties that they are obligated to um, comply with. Um, and the states are required to submit state reports updating the committee on their compliance with their respective treaty. And this depends on the treaty, but it usually occurs every four to five years. Um, periodic reviews are also a great opportunity for um, advocates because um, the uh, committees of experts um, also uh, accept um, reports from civil society organizations about the reality of going on the ground um, to uh, also understand and get a sense of um, where the state is, is complying or, or failing to comply with those with um, the obligations. And then they, they will bring it up to the uh, state um, in these, these re the review process. So essentially what happens is the state then issues the report and then um, comes to Geneva and um, sits before the committee of experts and the committee of experts then has an opportunity to question the state on uh, their compliance with certain things. And they use um, the, the committee of experts who uses the um, uh, reports from civil society and other organizations um, to uh, amplify their questions um, for the state. Um, the state then, um, the committee, the state then has an opportunity to respond. Um, and then the committee issues concluding observations, which essentially are a summary of the committee's assessment of the state's progress in fully realizing the human rights treaty in the respective state. It also highlights deficiencies, um, and they do that by expressing concern on certain aspects, um, and also provide um, recommendations for overall improvements um, to uh, comply with the treaty. There are also um, general recommendations and uh, comments. So TMBs provides guidance to states uh, by issuing these general recommendations or comments. 
um, and these provide authoritative guidance on states' obligations under different articles contained in each convention, so or each treaty. Um, nearly all of the TMBs have addressed reproductive rights through their general comments and recommendations. So these, these are essentially um, supportive documents to the treaties, um, and they provide um, additional guidance to what they mean within each provision in the treaty and, and further ways that the state can comply with um, the obligations set out in the treaty itself. Um, and then there are uh, optional protocols, which are treaties that follow human rights treaties that either provide greater detail on the procedures specific to the human rights treaty or address a, a substantive area related to the treaty. Um, so there are, uh, and most treaties do have optional protocols that the state can sign on to separately. Um, and they are um, an additional set of obligations um, and give the committee greater um, authority over the, um, the state. Um, there are also inquiry procedures and six of the TMBs, including the Committee on the Rights of the Child, may initiate uh, country inquiries if they receive information indicating that the relevant state has been involved in serious, grave, or systematic uh, violations of the relevant treaty. And in order for a TMB to initiate an inquiry, the state in question must have signed on to and ratified the requisite optional protocol for the treaty. Uh, the inquiry procedure is confidential and the relevant TMB will seek the cooperation of the state throughout the process. So in addition, uh, that was at the international level. And in, uh, in addition to the international level, we also have the regional human rights bodies. Um, in, and these uh, regional human rights bodies are in three regions uh, that hold states accountable uh, to, for human rights, uh, including adolescence rights. Um, the regions, the human rights bodies that exist are the uh, African Commission and Court on Human and People's Rights, which is responsible for overseeing the implementation of the Maputo Protocol, among others. Um, and the uh, European Court of Human Rights is responsible for interpreting the European Charter of Human Rights. Um, and then there's also the Inter-American Commission and Court on Human Rights, um, which is uh, responsible for interpreting and enforcing the um, American Convention on Human Rights. And however, as soon as our, our focus mostly today is on international, um, at the international level and UN level of mechanisms. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm not going to jump into too much detail about the regional level human rights bodies, but I wanted to include them um, to note that they are also an, uh, an avenue and mechanism for uh, advancing access. So moving to adolescents access um, to sexual and reproductive health services. Um, so to start, I wanted to align, so we're all aligned um, that we will use the UN definition of adolescence, um, which recognizes that adolescents are young people between the ages of 10 and 19. And of course, as you know, um, they are, uh, they all face, adolescents face a diverse range of barriers when accessing abortion care, and that can impact their lives and health and hindering the realization of their human rights. Um, so to start, we're going to delve into um, briefly into some of the barriers that exist, initially starting with some of the legal barriers. Um, so if you can think of any, if you want to, um, jump into the chat and mention any legal barriers that you can see um, or that you've seen in your work um, around uh, adolescents' access to accessing abortion care or sexual and reproductive health services generally. Yes, exactly. Um, yes, so I'm seeing in the chat, um, they need a parental approval, so parental authorization, exactly. That's definitely a legal barrier. Um, looking at others. Anyone else think of any other legal barriers, parental authorization is a really, really big barrier. Um, in the interest of time. Uh, 
And then multiple types of law, mandatory reporting, exactly. Oh, yeah, they're all coming now, great. Um, yeah, parental consent, exactly. Um, yeah, minimum age consent requirements. Um, yeah, there are a whole host of barriers, exactly. Um, okay, there we go. Um, so I've put the a number of ones just on a slide to compare. Um, of course, as you mentioned, there, there are a number of legal barriers. Um, the, the main ones that we've attempted to um, highlight here are restrictive legal and policy frameworks. So often laws and policies or lack thereof prevent or limit adolescents access to reproductive rights. For example, some laws and policies explicitly deny adolescents the right to access sexual and reproductive health services or require parental not notification or authorization. And such requirements or restrictions may apply to all minors or just those under a certain minimum age. Um, they also, of course, as you mentioned, the uh, parental authorization requirements. Uh, studies demonstrate that where adolescents are required to receive parental authorization, uh, they may opt to forego such services and uh, they will still engage in sexual activity. Sigma surrounding adolescent sexuality may make adolescents fearful of, negative, of a negative parental response, uh, especially for girls who generally face your greater stigma and discrimination surrounding their sexuality. And as we will see later in the presentation, many countries still impose parental authorization requirements for accessing abortion services. And finally, there's also judicial authorization requirements. Um, some countries will permit adolescents to obtain uh, judicial authorization in lieu of parental authorization um, for accessing certain uh, services such as abortion care. Um, and these requirements for judicial authorization are particularly problematic for adolescents due to the range of barriers that they face accessing formal judicial mechanisms and the stigma surrounding access to sexual and reproductive health services generally. Um, so these legal and policy frameworks um, must be responsive so to, to combat these barriers. Um, the, the legal frameworks must be responsive to both the need to ensure adolescents are protected from potential harm, while also enabling them to increasingly exercise their rights autonomously. Uh, this approach to a legal framework would ensure that adolescents develop into healthy adults who are able to thrive and equipped to live independently. So this is the balance between the protectionist approach, which protects adolescents from harm, generally has more restrictions around access um, in order to the thought is to protect them adolescents from from any harm or coercion um, and then an enabling approach which enables and gives the tools adolescents need um, to um, really thrive and, and be able to access the services that they need um, and these frameworks must strike a balance um, between protecting adolescents from force coercion exploitation and unwanted sexual contact um, while simultaneously recognizing that sexuality is a natural component of healthy adolescent development um, and the treaty bodies have recognized that there's a balance um, to be achieved between these approaches by urging uh, states to consider that, um, to consider and really um, adopt an approach that balances the need to protect adolescents while also providing space uh, for their evolving capacities, age, maturity, and uh, when determining the legal age for consent. So, Going back to the parental authorization requirements, um, I wanted to showcase our uh, World Abortion Laws map. Um, and uh, the, the map is available online on our website, um, and it showcases all of the abortion laws in um, every country in the world. Um, and we update it in real time. Um, so this is a current uh, view of what a uh, the abortion laws in the world look like. Um, these are the, la the laws that exist on paper or officially in adopted um, currently. Um, they do not reflect access on the ground, of course, um, but they do provide a, a brief snapshot of what um, the legal access to abortion looks like. Um, and uh, of course, as we mentioned, one of the key legal barriers is parental authorization requirements to accessing abortion services. 
Um, and this map also, we also include um, a number of um, indicators and one of the indicators on the online version of this map um, showcases all of the countries that still have parental authorization requirements um, in, in officially adopted um, in their abortion laws. Uh, so this map um, is also uh, a resource. It can be, it's freely available. It's available for a resource for advocates, the media, government officials, and civil society organizations uh, working to advance uh, abortion rights as human rights around the world. Um, as you can see, there are different colors on the map. And uh, we categorize uh, the countries based on um, the restrictiveness of their abortion law from a continuum from severely restrictive to a relatively liberal abortion law. So the severely restrictive are the, the dark red. They uh, completely prohibit abortion in all um, cases. The lighter red provide life exceptions for abortion. Um, and then the yellow uh, countries provide health exceptions, um, the light lighter blue kind of teal color um, or turquoise color um, provides broad social and economic exceptions and then the blue countries um, provide abortion on request up to certain gestational limits um, and and the goal for this is so that um, to provide this information so that human rights advocates can monitor how countries are protecting or denying abortion access around the world um, and as this methodology reflects the uh, official abortion law for um, the country, it does not indicate access on the ground. Um, and as we mentioned, um, of course, often barriers to accessing safe and legal abortion services, especially for populations like adolescents, make the reality of abortion services very different than uh, the law. So, for example, um, as we mentioned, uh, there, are, there are several countries that have parental abortion, uh, parental authorization requirements for abortion. Um, and many countries, often uh, countries that uh, provide abortion on request also have parental authorization requirements. Um, so the on request uh, uh, access is limited by, um, for those under the, the age of consent or the age, um, anyone who's considered a minor um, by, by print authorization requirements. And anyway, I'm trying to change the slide. Okay, there we go. Um, and uh, however, on a positive note, we have noticed uh, through our analysis that uh, worldwide over 60% of women of reproductive care, um, these are a reproductive health age, sorry, reproductive age, um, are ages uh, 15 through 49 uh, live um, in countries where abortion is broadly legal. Um, and also, as I'm Sherry Rare, moving on from the legal barriers to the practical barriers to access to uh, abortion services for adolescents. Um, feel free to drop in the chat if uh, any in your work that you've noticed, any practical barriers um, to adolescents accessing services. Can you think of any? What, what are some um, before we jump into to discuss them? Yep, exactly. Mandatory waiting counseling and waiting periods. Um, yep, I see that cultural beliefs, uh, restrictions around based on um, protectionist views, stigma. Yep, exactly. Um, yeah, harassment in front of in front of abortion clinics. Um, yeah, these are all very strong barriers. Great. Cultural beliefs can can create barriers for sure. Um, so if I can move over to the next slide, yeah. So I I was going to dive into this, but as you are all youth advocates and uh, very familiar and engaged in this work, um, I didn't want to repeat things that you may already know. So I just briefly um, mentioned some of the the practical barriers that exist. Um, yeah, so conscientious objection, exactly providers refusal to provide service. Um, 
yeah, technology, so confidentiality issues, absolutely. Um, so the, the practical barriers here, just stigma, as that was mentioned, um, access barriers to um, payment, so barriers to uh, the, the cost of services is simply too high, um, or there is a cost at all rather than freely accessible. Uh, the lack of access to information, uh, the inability for adolescents to even know that these services exist or where they exist um, or that they are safely and legally accessible. Um, also, uh, barriers, uh, geographic barriers, so barriers to location, um, distance to facilities, or a lack of uh, physical accessibility to the, to the clinic um, or to a health provider. Um, also, as Lynn's mentioned, lack of confidentiality um, around uh, technological surveillance or even just fear of um, accessing, attempting to access abortion care and then having their personal information be um, circulated um, and creating further perpetuating st stigma and then fear of poor quality of care as well. So now that we've highlighted all of these barriers um, and have a sense of both the legal and policy barriers, uh, how have human rights bodies attempted to address these barriers? So first, although many of the TMPs have affirmed the importance of providing adolescents access to sexual and reproductive health services, the Committee on the Rights of the Child, also known as the CRC, has been at the forefront of establishing these international human rights norms. The Convention and the Associated Committee on the Human Rights of the Child hear issues related specifically to adolescents and children and clearly articulate the specific obligations states have towards this portion of the population. The CRC is also the most widely ratified treaty in human rights law. Uh, currently, 196 countries have ratified the treaty, um, and the only country that has not ratified the CRC is the United States. Uh, the CRC has also urged um, the uh, states to ensure that health systems and services are able to meet specific sexual and reproductive health needs of adolescents, uh, and this includes uh, accessing safe abortion services. Um, they have also underscored the importance of adolescents to obtain access to age-appropriate, comprehensive, and inclusive sexual and reproductive health education and information. Um, and the CRC has made it clear that adolescents should have access to the full range of health of reproductive health services, including maternal health care, contraceptive information services, um, including the full range of contraceptive options, um, emergency contraception, safe abortion services and post-abortion care, and information and services to prevent sexually uh, prevent and address uh, sexually transmitted infections. And further, the CRC has urged states to decriminalize abortion to ensure that girls have access to safe abortion and post-abortion services. Um, and also decriminalization um, means that there is a full removal of all abortion provisions um, in the, the penal code. So often countries will, re will remove certain, uh, certain provisions of, uh, of uh, criminalizing abortion from their criminal code, um, but there will often be still a few uh, criminal or few provisions remaining um, and that uh, can still further perpetuate stigma because the government is still saying that there are certain instances where abortion should be criminalized um, and it, where voluntary abortion should still be criminalized. Um, and, and so often we'll see in the media that a country has decriminalized abortion when in reality they have just removed certain key provisions of abortion services um, rather than the full removal of um, of, of abortion uh, from the criminal code. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to flag that that um, is often a um, confusing and a different topic um, within uh, uh, yeah, the terminology. Um, so thing two, uh, key human rights principles. Um, so there are several human rights principles within uh, human rights law that are specifically for adolescents. Uh, so first, as we mentioned briefly previously, um, evolving capacities is a, is a key principle under human rights law concerning adolescents. 
This principle recognizes that as children mature, there are a, there's a reduced need for supervision and direction as they develop increased agency and greater capacity to make responsible decisions about their lives. Therefore, across different contexts and issues, children are entitled to different degrees of protection, participation, and opportunities for autonomous decision making. And in a, furthermore, in accordance with the evolving capacities of the child and recognizing adolescents have an inherent right to make autonomous decisions about their reproductive health, the CRC has called for a legal presumption that adolescents are competent to seek and access preventative or time-sensitive sexual and reproductive health commodities and services. Um, so there's, they're saying that states must um, enable adolescents to access these services and assume that they have the capacity to, to consent to accessing these services um, rather than going through mandatory waiting periods, parental requirements, uh, judicial authorization requirements, et cetera. There's also a principle called the special measures of protection uh, and in recognition of the involving capacities and unique vulnerabilities of children, states are required under the CRC to take special measures of protection. Um, within this context, children's dignity and integrity must be respected and promoted by viewing them as rights bearers as opposed to victims. Treaty monitoring bodies have found that the denial of services and um, the denial of sexual and reproductive health services to adolescents can violate their right to special measures of protection. Um, and this was found in um, landmark cases uh, known as KL v. Peru and LC v. Peru, uh, where adolescents were denied legal abortion services and the courts found um, that this was a violation of their right to the special measures of protection. Further, there is also a principle known as the best interests of the child principle. Um, and the human rights framework requires that children's best interests must always be the primary consideration in decisions affecting them. In the context of healthcare settings, uh, the CRC has made clear that uh, healthcare professionals and other state actors must observe the best interests of the child and ensure that his or her rights to protection, well being, and development are being fulfilled. Um, and the CRC has also urged states to review their legislation in order to guarantee the best interests of pregnant adolescents and ensure that their views are always heard and respected in abortion related decisions. There are a few more uh, key principles, including the right to access comprehensive reproductive health services. So TMBs have recognized that adolescents have the right to access the full range of sexual and reproductive health services, including uh, proper maternal health care, um, access to safe abortion and post-abortion care, et cetera. Um, so that was, as was previously mentioned, this is also uh, the right to access these, these services um, without barriers to access, as we mentioned. Um, further, there's also presumption of capacity. Um, as the CRC has mentioned, there is a legal presumption um, that is its own principle. Um, and further, the, the TMBs have condemned requirements mandating parental uh, involvement for adolescents uh, seeking reproductive health services, recognizing that parental consent and notification requirements acts as barriers to health services and should be removed. Such requirements, uh, of course, can make uh, adolescents reluctant to access this uh, needed services um, and so as to avoid seeking parental consent, which may result in rejection, stigmatization, hostility, and even violence. Um, and so the, the human rights bodies have, are, have recognized that this is a significant barrier and should be removed um, as it uh, hinders adolescents' right to access uh, the full range of services as they have um, recognized that is a significant or concrete right that adolescents have. Um, and adolescents who request services have uh, clearly been able to recognize their own need for services um, and can take the initiative to seek them out, providing ample evidence for their capacity to make decisions about their own health. Um, there is also the right to be free from violence and coercion, including healthcare settings. So adolescents also have a right to refuse health services um, and to be free from force, violence, pressure, and coercion um, when using these, these health services. So they, they have uh, the right of refusal, of course, as well. 
So there's also a role um, within access to services around age of consent laws. Um, so age of consent laws impact the access to uh, sexual and reproductive health services and abortion, um, including abortion care, um, because of the stigma and fear of prosecution attached to those under the age of consent um, who are seeking abortion care. Laws regulating age of consent to sex are often primarily geared towards preventing sexual violence and exploitation. Uh, in, in their efforts to prevent sexual violence, these laws generally adopt a bright line rule that certain individuals, those below a specific age, cannot legally consent to sex, and therefore any sex with an individual uh, under this age is deemed a crime. Um, and such, and often in, in these circumstances, there's no examination into whether an individual had the capacity to and willingly express consent. So if an adolescent in, um, in a uh, country where there are um, very strong uh, age of consent laws um, with no um, exceptions, um, they, they're often, that's often an additional barrier because if they were to seek abortion care, then it was presumed that um, they, there is often a fear of prosecution and, and a presumption um, that they did not consent um, to, the, to um, engaging in the activity. Um, of course, this is where the balance of protection and protectionist and enabling frameworks comes in, um, because of course uh, the, the state still wants to protect against uh, non-consensual um, uh, sexual activity and, and violence and protect adolescents and children against coercion um, and exploitation. However, at the same time, um, there's a balance with ensuring that adolescents do still have access to care. Um, and, this, at the same time, these bright line age of consent laws may also include certain moral objectives or gender-based stereotypes. For example, um, they may include exceptions for individuals who are married or set forth different ages of consent for boys and girls. Uh, the CRC has recognized that age of consent laws should be the same for all genders. Uh, states must adopt a minimum age of consent um, adopt and implement minimum age of consent laws that do not differentiate by gender and recognize that adolescents under the age of 18 have different needs based on their maturity, maturity, evolving capacities, and age. The CRC has also recognized that states increase um, the, legal, uh, the legal age of consent to sexual activity to 16 years old and harmonize at, at the very minimum um, and harmonize the age of consent laws between boys and girls. I, yes. Um, however, TMBs have not yet addressed how age of consent laws can impact adolescents' access to reproductive health services. Uh, the CRC has not yet considered how such laws can impact access to services in countries that categorize all sex among minors as criminal acts, um, as we discussed before, those bright line age of consent laws. Um, and however, the, the CRC has considered um, and, and called on states to, to balance these, this, um, this approach between the protectionist and enabling frameworks, um, noting that uh, they need to take into account the balance protection and evolving capacities in determining the legal age of, uh, for sexual consent. There are also, um, um, so there are also a number of specific human rights uh, related to adolescents' access to um, sexual and reproductive health services, including abortion services. Uh, you can use these rights um, to highlight how states have not fulfilled their obligations to ensuring adolescents' access to abortion services. Um, just briefly, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through them all in depth, but um, some of the key rights um, that hinge, uh, that ground adolescents' uh, right to accessing services include the right to confidentiality. So adolescents have a right to confidentiality and human rights bodies have recognized uh, this right to confidentiality specifically for adolescents in the provision of health services, uh, including sexual and reproductive health services, and that violations of this right implicate uh, the rights to health and privacy. So there are also, of course, the right to health, the right to privacy, the right to equality and non-discrimination. 
where states are obligated to take affirmative measures to protect children's rights to non-discrimination and diminish or eliminate conditions that cause discrimination through measures such as legislative changes, changes in administration, resource allocation, and education measures designed to change attitudes. Um, and then there's also the right to be free from torture, cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment, also known as TCIDT. And uh, within this specific right, the CRC has stated that the failure to provide essential medicines to children uh, can constitute neglect. Um, and international and regional human rights bodies have found that the denial of sexual and reproductive health services to adolescents um, in certain circumstances can amount to cruel and human and degrading treatment. There's also um, specific to uh, children and adolescents, there's um, a right to be heard. Um, and this is a, a specific right that is um, enshrined in the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, and the right to be heard means that children have the right to freely express their views in all manners affecting them and in accordance with the children's age and maturity and their views must be given due consideration. In the context of decisions about abortion, the CRC has gone further than just calling for an adolescent's right to voice her opinion, indicating that pregnant adolescents' uh, views should be always be respected. Um, and this demonstrates an understanding that um, any uh, adolescent who becomes pregnant should be enabled to make their own decision about that pregnancy. And finally, there's also the right to life, survival, and development, which is also a specific right to uh, children and adolescents. Um, and the Convention on the Rights of the Child, again, provides an expansive protection for this right, um, extending to beyond the right to life outlined in other human rights treaties. Um, and uh, the CRC has interpreted children's rights uh, to development um, broadly to include their physical, mental, spiritual, moral, psychological, and social development, and has urged states to take measures to achieve the optimal development of all children. And guaranteeing all adolescents the right to autonomously make decisions about their uh, sexual and reproductive health is a critical step towards realizing this, this right to uh, life, survival, and development. Now, with all of that content, um, what are after, how can we use this for opportunities for action? How can all of this information um, and all of these rights and, and um, outlines and human rights bodies, um, how can they be used to advance action? So there's a few ways that uh, TMBs and human rights mechanisms can be used to advocate for adolescents' access to abortion services. Um, first, there is the opportunity to litigate or support litigation through um, fact-finding or providing reports um, on uh, the current reality of, of the, the situation um, or supporting litigation in uh, certain ways. So there are, there are three landmark cases that can be used as precedent or can also um, be uh, used uh, that have shown that this, uh, the litigation is a, is a, can be a very successful tool for accessing or advancing um, abortion access for adolescents. So specifically, as I mentioned before, there's a, there's a case called KLV Peru. Um, and uh, in this case, which was litigated before the Human Rights Committee, which is another treaty body committee or treaty monitoring body, they ruled that denying a 17 year old uh, access to abortion services and compelling her to carry to term a fetus that no, had no chance of survival after birth amounted to cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment. So as I mentioned before, that there were certain circumstances where um, adolescents uh, had must have access to abortion services or it would result in TCIDT and this is one of the cases. Um, there is also a case called PNS v Poland um, where the European Court of Human Rights so a regional human rights body found that the treatment of a 14 year old petitioner who or 14 year old adolescent um, the person who was petitioning in the court um, was who was denied abortion services had her confidential medical information revealed to the public and was wrongly treated uh, removed from her mother's care um, this this circumstance also amounted to cruel and human and degrading treatment because it violated a number of her rights 
and recently um, in Paula v. Ecuador, um, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights recognized that the evolving capacities of children and adolescents with regard to their sexual and reproductive rights um, by explaining that the rights to personal integrity and privacy entails freedoms such as sexual freedom and the freedom to control their own bodies, all of which can be exercised using evolving capacities um, and maturity. Um, there are also opportunities you can engage with the CRC, other treaty or other monitoring bodies, um, or at the regional level, but predominantly the CRC is the, the best focal point for um, adolescents' access and adolescents' rights at the international level. Um, and the CRC routinely calls for submissions um, when generating new comments, um, and also uh, provides opportunities to report uh, violations um, for specific countries during uh, periodic review reporting cycles. Um, and then there's also opportunities for collaboration uh, with other organizations and conducting fact-finding reports um, on, on various issues in access to um, adolescents' rights and abortion services. And that is it from me. Um, thank you all very much. Um, I am here. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, and yeah, feel free to drop them in the chat or we can also, I believe I see some hands here. Okay, let me, sorry, I'm sharing my screen. So um, yes. Shruti, yes. I can't really see anyone. Uh, <laughs> yeah, hi. Uh, so we have Biuba first. You can unmute yourself and ask the question. Um, hello, everyone. Good evening from Nairobi, Kenya. Thank you so much for the amazing session. I wanted to ask a question, especially with regards to adolescence, since it's what we are speaking about today. And I'm sorry if there's a bit of background noise. I'm on the move, so that's what you could be hearing. If it's too much, let me know and they can stop. Uh, but my question is, with regards to adolescents and uh, knowing fully well that adolescents are defined differently within different entities, especially within the UN and then within different constitutions and then within different policies that come up, and the conflict that has been there, Kenya being an example where around July this year, a lot of uh, reproductive health policies were passed, one being that of adolescents. And one of the contradicting factors, huge contradicting factors that was there is the fact that uh, there is a bit of double standards with regards to how adolescents can experience their consent with regards to sexual and reproductive health rights and services, vis-a-vis -vis how in the same breath those same rights are taken. And one of the things that hugely came out was the fact that for example, if you're below 18, uh, you can only get uh, reproductive health services and rights when you go with either a guardian or a parent. And the same same the same same policy then goes ahead and criminalizes parents or guardians of these children because then, uh, in, in in a case in a, in a situation where this this child goes and gets any of these services, or in a case where this child, for example, gets pregnant and all that kind of stuff and need some of these services and 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 uh, they, they they go getting these services the 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 criminalization of the parent comes in because there is a direct assumption of the fact that the parent was not doing his or her duty to protect this child and to care for this child that's why they needed all that and so my question maybe would be to ask in an event where the Kenya shrinking space with regard to sexual and reproductive health rights, it continues to become bigger and bigger and bigger. How can we? How can we seek? How can we seek one uh, international support, but also two? Considering Kenya has signed a lot of treaties that are supposed to align with one human rights, but also two some of these things, including you know. Um, adolescents and all that, how can we foster litigation for adolescent uh, adolescent persons who are trying to seek sexual and reproductive health and rights while recognizing their full right to be able to exercise consent as people who are entitled to that, especially in a country where cases of especially sexual and gender-based violence and defilement are at an all-time all -time high. Thank you so much. 
Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Thank you um, uh, for that. Uh, yeah, so that's that's also um, another great example of, of a barrier that um, it seems like uh, Kenya has been able to get around or, or just find another way to create barriers that doesn't criminalize the adolescence itself, but um, or I think they do in other ways, but they um, in this specific instance, they're criminalizing the parents um, and uh, and still enabling adolescents to access services, but, but still creating this kind of this barrier. Um, I would say in terms of options or, or things to do um, at the international level, um, when the, so the, the main, so the CRC is definitely the main um, a treaty monitoring body to, to report to. So they, when, whenever Kenya, Kenya is a, a ratified party to, to the CRC. So whenever the the CRC is issuing um, requests for submissions. Um, that's definitely an opportunity to uh, report on, um, submit a, a report on, on um, what is going on, um, because that is clearly a violation of, or that is that is creating a barrier to adolescents' ability to access services. Um, and then there are also other treaty bodies like the the committee on the elimination of discrimination against all forms or all forms of discrimination against women um, known as CEDA also um, has some provisions in there around access to services um, that could also be used um, and and then there are also the re regional um, human rights bodies so the Maputo protocol um, and the African court um, on human rights people's rights um, they also um, have uh, provisions for access to, to reproductive and health services for adolescents so those um, are also opportunities if they issue for um, they open a call or request for reports um, which they they periodically do um, that's a, a great way to a great opportunity to to hold um, the state accountable um, and then also there there could be opportunities at the national level um, in in enforcing these the um, or reminding um, the the government um, and advocating for um, their their obligations just reminding them of their obligations to to the treaties that they have signed um, so yeah and and I uh, know that there's there's just so there are a broad range of opportunities, but they're also often um, in there often a lot of there's a lot of bureaucracy to go through when accessing them too. I'm aware. Yeah, thanks, Margaret. Uh, I can see Innocent's hand is up, but I just wanted to quickly say one thing and also ask you because it's very much connected to what you're saying. One of the things that you said is that also collection of fact-finding reports. So I was just wondering, you know, there are so many countries that have higher age of consent, say 18. Even in India, the age of consent is 18. And we know because of that, there are so many violations that happen. But I was just wondering, is there a resource which actually talks about uh, some of the violations uh, that happens because of this? Or is that something that probably can be done, uh, you know, in countries where we find that this is problematic? Um, I would have to, I could look into that. I'm not sure off the top of my head. I, I don't know, um, but I can uh, look into that and, and get back to you about that. Um, sure. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Innocent, you can go next. Thank you. Um, just to confirm, you're getting me right. Yes, can hear you. Thank you. This is Innocent Deje, uh, checking in from Kenya again. Uh, thank you, Biba. Biba, I think Biba read my mind and uh, she asked the first question that I wanted to ask. So the next question maybe I want to uh, inquire is, uh, now that we are having this uh, uh, opposition that is coming in so fast, uh, looking at the fact, uh, an example like uh, the United States of America, where we are, we are having uh, we, we are we are having some of the states where abortion, self abortion was uh, was uh, banned, and then it's a reflection on our uh, on, on our countries whereby we are most of us are in the third world countries and the developing countries. So, um, what do you think uh, needs to be done for us to because we need to stand on our own, but at the same time. We really uh, look for uh, look up to the developed countries to maybe give us a guidance. 
but if they are now taking a different direction, how do we walk around this? How, what do you think needs to be done for us to walk around this when it comes to uh, working with the opposition? Because right now the opposition has really taken space, it has really taken shape, even in our own countries. For example, in Kenya, people talked about the policies that we have, which do not speak to the needs of the adolescents. So what do you think we need to do other than uh, CSE, uh, which uh, I think comprehensive sexuality education has, has, has a little impact, but it's not also being implemented. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so the I agree implementation is is a challenge um, and definitely um, something that uh, civil society, the, the CRC and, and human rights bodies definitely rely on civil society at the national level and in within countries to to enforce implementations. So that's also a great guidance um, The the treaty bodies will issue these the issue of guidance and, and then um, rely or, or um, support, uh, well not support, but hope that civil society organizations and, and give civil society organizations the, the language to um, then go and, and enforce the, the government to um, implement these the, the provisions um, that the, the treaty bond nutrient bodies have issued. Um, but yeah, no, that, that is a great question about um, what is the role of the, the global north and, and how can the um, how can uh, what is how can what is the support um, that uh, the global north can give um, and and also I think just I I don't I unfortunately don't have an answer for you um, I think the it is it is a challenge that I think a lot of people are grappling with um, and that we are um, I think the regional human rights bodies um, are, are just as effective, if not maybe more effective um, at enforcing and implementing um, or in enforcing uh, countries to implement. Um, and um, the have also have very specific um, provisions um, and especially the Maputo protocol actually has the strongest provisions of um, any regional or generally over yeah, many regional human rights treaty around um, abortion access as well. Um, so, so that is also a great treaty to rely on um, and enforce accountability mechanisms. But generally, I think this is just unfortunately a larger question that I don't, I don't have a, a broader answer to. Yeah, I think what is important is, you know, what you said about regional bodies being sometimes more effective than global so that's important and that is that is there in case of africa um mm -hmm. yeah pupa still hand, has her hand up i don't know if she has another question or if it is from before uh yes yes i do have another question and uh, the question i wanted to ask was with regards to uh Particularly myself, I am from Queer Republic and I work also mainly on LGBTQ rights. And one of the biggest issues we have, especially knowing fully that access to healthcare services is difficult for LGBTQ uh, adults, but even more so for LGBTQ plus uh, adolescents. And for me, I was asking with regards to even things like self abortion, because I think one of the biggest misconceptions we have in the in this country and in most African countries is that uh, as a member of the LGBTQ community, first of all, you don't require require things like access to self abortion and all that kind of stuff, or consenting to that in that regard. But also people with that same regard, they don't pay attention to the fact that uh, LGBTQ children plus persons are big victims of uh you know things like corrective rep they are big victims of you know uh defilement and all that kind of stuff and when things like this happen considering we live in a country that doesn't legalize the existence of these people and uh again i will still refer to reproductive health policies we have i said in july we had a, a number of policies with regard to sexual reproductive health rights and services uh being being you know being uh, launched and when they were launched one of it was the national reproductive health uh, uh, policy and in this policy first of all the language is very criminalizing 
uh, the language is very discriminating of populations like the LGBTQ youth and adolescents. And so my question then would be, again, not necessarily on litigation, but with regards to advocacy, what does it look like? And what, if, if I may ask, what are some of the uh, examples, country examples or regional examples that we can borrow from with regards to advocacy on the work that we can do to ensure LGBTQ plus adolescents and uh, and and uh, uh, teenagers are able to be protected by these same laws in the same light and capacity in which uh, non LGBTQ uh, plus uh, teenagers and adolescents could be protected. Thank you. Absolutely, uh, yeah, and that's also another great question. Um, yeah, so so of course there's some intersectional forms of discrimination um, that these communities are facing, um, and there are the the I'm trying to think off the top of my head. Um, there are um, a, f a few cases that have I'm trying to think if uh, specifically about cases that have uh, involved specific forms of intersectional discrimination and access to services. And generally, um, these cases do not, that I can, that I have um, worked on or um, been a uh, researcher uh, investigated have not um, involved uh, LGBTQI, uh, the LGBTQI community. Um, however, um, there are a number of cases that maybe could be relied on in terms of basing on the informed um, forms of intersectional discrimination. Um, so I think the Aline case, um, there's a case called Aline v. Brazil, um, based in Brazil, um, that really highlights the, the intersectional forms of discrimination um, in, in as a barrier to accessing services. Um, and I, I think there, there might be some in, opportunities for creative advocacy here and, and also using um, cases that don't, or case studies or oper uh, advocacy opportunities that um, are, are similar, but not directly, but using the same approaches. Um, so I'd say uh, off the top of my head, I think Aline v. Brazil is the best um, case that I can think of, um, but I can also circulate. We have two publications um, around capacity to, it's called uh, Capacity and Consent to Adolescence, um, which covers a broad um, base of uh, advocacy um, case studies um, or case studies of, of barriers to ad, uh, access that adolescents have faced and, and how they have been addressed. Um, and then we also have a, a new tool um, and it's also a publication um, called the Lit Litigation Mapping Tool. And that also includes uh, several cases and human rights norms um, that I can send you that may have more information than I can remember off the top of my head. Yeah, thanks Margaret. I think uh, just one other thing that uh, she asked about access to services for LGBTQ communities. Uh, and, you know, even in India, I think the context is kind of similar, if not exactly the same, that we had the colonial law, Section 377, that criminalized uh, queer identities, queer people. Um, and I think like in Kenya, it is uh, the Supreme Court has said that it is unconstitutional and it has been removed from the IPC. And after that, we have seen a series of judgments uh, which are uh, on trans people's access to services, which are on right to privacy of LGBTQ individuals. And these are judgments which have come from the Supreme Court. Uh, so, you know, there are times when a Supreme Court has reciprocated to some of the petitions filed by activists. And there are times when we see that, you know, we, we do not see the results immediately. Um, but I think uh, the, the courts, the country courts uh, is probably one of the spaces to advocate for, especially when it comes to uh, LGBTQ people. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to share that. I don't see any further questions. Um, I have an inquiry kindly. Um, and this one is to you. <laughs> uh, 
maybe if it's something maybe you could consider in the future i remember the first training we had i think it was last year or if, if it's not this year in the, in the beginning we had a training on vcat uh, on issues around abortion now we are having this, this training i don't know if is it could it be possible uh with with respect to uh Bibwa's question, will, will it be possible to have maybe some something like more, uh, maybe just an engagement on how we can advance our advocacy strategies? Because I uh, because uh, the question of abortion is a, a very critical question, especially in the African countries. So I think uh, if it could be possible, uh, you just organize or help us to organize and then uh, we have a, a question or a learning uh, engagement to learn from people uh, individuals from different countries developed countries i understand countries like south africa it's 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 legal uh we have other countries where it's just legal and everything's running well so if it can be possible uh you also uh maybe organize something on that maybe a one day or maybe a two-day engagement with the, the developed countries and the ones which have had these experiences so that we can learn and understand how we can conduct our advocacy as well to be able to uh be able to uh, work with our opposition effectively. Yes, Thank yes. Um, I have definitely taken point on this and we can schedule maybe another session to just strategize and see, you know, what are the ways in which we can continue national level work, regional level work, and where we might need expertise from an organization such as Center for Reproductive Rights. Uh, and uh, Margaret, for example, you said that there are times when you be, when countries or the states can submit the reports. So, you know, if information like that is coming, then if that can be circulated and we can mobilize accordingly, I think that might be a good way forward. Um, and I'm also mindful of the time. Uh, and I know Margaret had said an hour for the session today. So uh, with that, and, you know, hoping that we will connect again and we will take these conversations uh, forward. Um, I think it is a good point to stop. And um, yeah, we have another session uh, coming up. I will circulate the, the date for the next session um, within this week. Uh, but this was a very, very insightful session. I think there were just so many um, intricacies, so many insightful things about the CRC that you shared, Margaret. And uh, I think that that is where if you circulate the presentation and we pick up the points, that's where uh, the meat is. And we're really uh, going to try and, you know, strategize on some of those things. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so much for taking out the time and sharing all of this with us. Absolutely. Uh, thank you all. Um, yes. And I will be sure to circulate the presentation um, and then the two publications I mentioned as well. Yes. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone. See you all again soon.